So I must admit that I do draw some kind of special energy out of the fact that glasses are among the most mundane and ubiquitous materials that touch all facets of human life. And yet big brain physicists like us, at some level, just do not understand what they are. And so I've spent um, quite some time uh, using small beam diffraction and trying to decode the speckle in these diffraction patterns to understand the structure of glasses. But I haven't been doing this work in a vacuum. And so I'd really like to thank um, very substantial contributions over time uh, from my frequent co-author, Tim Peterson, uh, and also a postdoctoral researcher, Hoyen Pham, who's been uh, working very hard on this project, as you'll see. I'd also like to thank the contributions of some talented uh, Monash University students, uh, collaborations and interactions uh, with people in the School of Physics and Astronomy, the School of Chemistry and the Department of Material Science and Engineering, um, my colleagues at the Monash Centre for Electron Microscopy, collaborators at the Australian Synchrotron and CSIRO, uh, and also external collaborators from uh, Ames Lab, Arus University, and the universities of Sydney and Milan. And I'd also really like to acknowledge um, these two fellowships, the uh, Margaret Clayton Women in Science Fellowship uh, and the Future Fellowship that I'm currently on for giving me the time and the space to pursue this line of inquiry. So first of all, I'd like to start with something which is a little bit provocative. Uh, so this is the IUCR definition of crystallography which is the branch of science devoted to the study of molecular and crystalline structure and properties. Now, whenever I read something like this, I always think to myself, but what about everything else? Uh, and in line with what the uh, esteemed crystallographer McKay has suggested, I sometimes suspect that crystallography has just been a little bit too successful. So the success of crystallography, where we can basically solve the structures of objects that have a prominent point and translational symmetry has, has led us to basically focus on problems that are very tractable uh, and ignore all of the other different kinds of, of matter that occur in the world. And I also think similar to McKay that there must be better systems that can capture the structural complexity of materials as you span that great divide between order and disorder. And while my research doesn't give any easy answers to this question, uh, it does, however, demonstrate that this question is really worth asking. So I believe that to study disorder, coherent small probe beams are actually going to play a very large role. So you can see here when I restrict the size of my beam to the size of some relevant correlation length in the material, in this case, a coordination polyhedron. The diffuse and isotropic diffracted intensity from a disordered material actually breaks up into these discrete patches of intensity that we call speckle. Uh, and here you see down here where I've calculated the structure factor in three dimensions from a small volume of glass the structure factor has broken up into these discrete patches. And where it's cut by the evolved sphere, we get um, projected intensities in our measured diffraction pattern. And these intensities actually com contain information that's strongly linked to the local order in the volume that we probe. So in this talk, I have to apologize. I use K and Q somewhat interchangeably for the scattering vector. Uh, these just vary by a factor of 2 pi, um, but they always have the units of inverse length. Now, why is this an interesting experiment to do? Well, many material phenomena are like truly multi-scale. So I'll be showing you some glassy phenomena today, but there are also phenomena that are linked to self-assembly and self-organization. And despite the fact that these phenomena are multi-scale, they are really linked to local order. And so you want to have a technique that can make that link between local order and the larger scale phenomena. Uh, and this kind of experiment uh, really allows you 
to tune your radiation type, so X-rays or electrons, your beam size, your spatial scanning or sampling, to probe disorder at many length scales, giving you the potential for some kind of unified framework. Now, here's some example of the measurements that I have done on glasses. So you can see here, I've done some measurements of small angle X-ray diffraction from a colloidal glass, uh, and also measurements using electron nanodiffraction from an atomic glass. So in our large area diffraction pattern, we have these very diffuse isotropic rings. Uh, in the case of the colloidal glass, the form factor that modulates this is from the microspheres. Uh, in the case of the atomic glass, the form factor is, is simply the atomic form factor. When we shrink our beam down to the micro size using an aperture or the nano size by converging our electron beam, you can see that these diffuse rings break up into these speckle patterns. Uh, and here the size of the speckle is small, and that's because the X-ray beam has a very small angular width. Uh, and here the size of the speckle is a little bit larger because we're using uh, a converged electron beam. But in both cases, the speckle contains valuable information about the local order. Now, however, I don't want to suggest that broad beam traditional diffraction measurements on glasses tell you nothing. So actually, the um, broad beam diffraction pattern and the structure factor that you obtain from it are related by a Fourier transform to the radial distribution function which I show here in the case of this amorphous silicon. And this radial distribution function tells you about the averaged pair distances in your material. So for example, you can get very robust information uh, about the coordination, um, the number of uh, neighbors in your coordination sphere, uh, and different correlation lengths in your material. However, this one dimensional function does not show you the higher order atomic correlations. So for example, it won't show you what the three body correlations are or the bond angles. Um, and also you cannot use this information to solve your structure, like in the same sense that you use X-ray diffraction to solve a crystalline structure. So if you want to get particle level information from this pair distribution function, um, the best you can do is refine atomic models so that they're consistent with this RDF. Uh, and this is what uh, Tim Peterson has done in these very nice models down here that he prepared using reverse Monte Carlo. Uh, both of these models fit this radial distribution function equally well, um, but you can see that they are not, not unique. And that's, that's the problem with this approach. So here, uh, a, a nanocrystal has actually nucleated uh, whereas here, you're just getting a continuous random network. And so, evidently, we need some new approaches. Now, glasses have a very particular problem. Um, they pose a very particular problem for physicists, which is quite intriguing. Uh, and that is why we can't understand why they are, in fact, rigid. So, you can see it here for liquids, the force on any given atom is unbalanced, and that gives rise to this property of flow. Now, if you cool a liquid down, you can, uh, the system can undergo a phase transition to the crystalline phase, where order arises, or physicists will call it broken symmetry. And the forces on any given particle are actually now balanced, and the material attains this property of rigidity. Now, if you cool down your liquid really quickly, so if you quench your system, then you can avoid the transformation to the crystalline phase and you obtain a glass. Now, the glass has no apparent order, no apparent broken symmetry, and yet the forces on any given particle are still unbalanced. Um, and strangely enough, uh, it has solidified. So here's a concrete uh, example of this um, for a real system. So this is an X-ray diffraction measurement uh, on an electrostatically levitated melt. Um, it actually happens to be the uh, commercial 
uh, metallic glass vitrolloy 106. And you can see that um, as we cool the system down through this glass transition TG, the order that you can see in the structure factor does not really change that much at all. Uh, and yet here in the vicinity of the glass transition, the viscosity exponentially increases. Now, this, the glasses that I'm going to be talking about today are actually quite nice model systems. So these are hard sphere um, glasses that are formed from colloids uh, or metals. And these systems are dense, so they're quite nicely modelled by sort of dense random packing of um, uh, ball bearings, as you see here in this picture. Um, and they're dense in the sense that the uh, vertex of one polyhedron uh, is actually the, the centre of the next polyhedron. So there's no, you know, gaps or spaces, no areas where you might have stronger order or less order. Uh, and these glasses have like a veritable zoo of different local arrangements. And so how can you characterise that and how can you capture it? So in 1983, um, Steinhardt, Nelson and Ronchetti uh, introduced these parameters called the bond orientational order parameters. Uh, and these are simply the rotationally uh, averaged spherical harmonic functions that fingerprint the angular arrangement or the symmetry of particles around a central atom. Uh, so here I'm showing these bond orientational order parameters for these different archetypal polyhedral types. And you can see that they're very strong fingerprints, okay? They vary a lot. Um, depending on the different kinds of local symmetry. And it would be no exaggeration to say that these BOO parameters have been used in thousands and thousands of studies on structure in liquids and glasses and semi-ordered systems. But the drawback of these BOO parameters is that you need to know your particle positions in three dimensions. So either from a simulation or macroscopic particles that you can measure, uh, or microspheres where you can tomographically reconstruct your whole volume using confocal optical microscopy. And uh, the other problem with these uh, BOO parameters is that um, even though they are a flexible and sensitive set of local structural order parameters, they don't really capture what's going on at the glass transition. So you can see here, um, these are calculations I've done uh, from models from Peter Harrowell in Sydney. Uh, for these different metallic systems at these different temperatures, the distributions of these BOO parameters actually vary somewhat smoothly. So while they are sensitive and flexible, um, they don't seem to be capturing you know, what's going on at the glass transition. Uh, but I will, however, note that no other structural parameter has been able to capture that, which is part of the problem. So keeping this in mind, I set out to try to measure some kind of order parameters from my small beam diffraction. So here you can see the geometry for scanning electron nanodiffraction, uh, where I have my focused beam um, tuned to the size of a coordination polyhedron and I scan it across the surface of my specimen. And if I just play this video, you can see the kinds of diffraction patterns that I actually obtain. So you can see that the speckle patterns change from area to area quite quickly. Uh, sometimes they have um, strong, strong angular symmetries in them, and sometimes they seem um, perfectly disordered. So to obtain some uh, order parameters that I could measure from these um, diffraction patterns, I calculated uh, this beast here, which is the angular order correlation function. And so what the guts of this is that you take your diffraction pattern, uh, you translate it by an angular increment delta, you multiply it by itself, and then you average this over all of your azimuthal angles. And so here I'm showing this um, angular order correlation function as a function of delta, uh, but also as a function of scattering vector k. 
And you can see that there's this band here where we have a lot of prominent angular symmetries, which corresponds to this um, first sharp diffraction peak, uh, which in real space is the first coordination shell. Um, and it's uh, intriguing that you can see so many different symmetries um, just from an individual pattern. So to quantify this even further, I fitted this angular autocorrelation function at every value of k uh, with um, a Fourier series and obtained the Fourier coefficients uh, of each of my symmetries. Uh, and so this is what I'm displaying down here. And so you can see that yes, in this um, area of the first sharp diffraction peak, we have some very prominent angular symmetries that we're extracting using this method. And so going forward, I average these coefficients over the area, over the region corresponding to this first sharp diffraction peak. And I call these my um, uh, symmetry magnitudes, um, order parameters, or, or Fourier coefficients. So initially, I set out to prove that these were indeed sensitive to very local order within my glass. So you can see here I've simulated an electron nano diffraction pattern of an icosahedron looking down its tenfold axis of symmetry uh, on top of a very large slab of a metallic glass. And even though you, you can't really tell that there's this prominent tenfold symmetry in your diffraction pattern, if you calculate the angular autocorrelation and you map out the n equals 10 Fourier coefficient, you can see that you do see very, very strong elevation in the tenfold symmetry in the region where the polyhedron is. And so encouraged by this, I actually mapped out various symmetries uh, for a metallic glass. Um, and this is my model uh, and this is my experiment and you can see they compare quite nicely. Uh, I couldn't see any real extended correlations that other people had missed <laughs> in my maps, which is quite nice. Um, and at most, uh, if there were extended correlations, um, they related to uh, either phase sharing or interpenetrating polyhedral packing. But when I was doing this, um, I was somehow inspired to think, could I use these um, angular symmetries uh, or order parameters in a more quantitative way? Now, glasses are very inconvenient because they lack translational symmetry, but sometimes they can help you out in, in a certain sense. Uh, and so uh, in a glass, the glass is isotropic and all directions are virtually the same. So if you do have like a prominent structural motif in your glass and you scan your beam across the material, then you will also be sampling this prominent motif in every single possible orientation. And so using this fact, uh, I tried to calculate some uh, projected bond orientational order parameters to see if they would give me a strong fingerprint of the different kinds of order that I might have in my glass. So to do that, um, I got these different kinds of uh, archetypal polyhedra. Uh, here I'm picking on the icosahedron because it's supposed to be energetically favored in the melt because it has uh, the highest point symmetry and the smallest possible volume of any 13, 13 atom cluster. Uh, and it's also supposed to be um, implicated somehow in the glass transition because it's a non-crystallographic polyhedron. So it frustrates crystalline packing. Uh, so I rotated this through uh, all um, possible angular orientations. And then I took these lovely attractive symmetric maps and I averaged them to obtain my projected Boo parameters. So it's, it's evident that compared to these three-dimensional Boo parameters, like my projected Boo parameters have lost a lot of symmetry, a lot of information. They're not as strong fingerprints of local order. But you can still see that there are significant differences between them. So for example, the uh, cubic clusters 
Um, the highest magnitude is in the n equals 4 Fourier coefficient. Uh, compared to the um, hexagonal closed pact or icosahedral cluster, where the highest um, Fourier coefficient is uh, n equals 6. Uh, and also the icosahedral cluster, which has the highest point symmetry. So that means that in virtually any direction you look down, you will see a symmetry. You can see that the um, distribution is somewhat flat, uh, but peaked at uh, n equals 6 and n equals 10. So to show how useful these uh, projected BOO parameters were for quantifying local order from diffraction alone, I actually looked for a really nice model system. Uh, and I chose the system of monodisperse colloidal spheres in solution. So these are really nice uh, because as you can see from this phase diagram here, the native interaction between the spheres is actually repulsive because they have a negative charge. And so the equilibrium phase is BCC, which is the spheres trying to get as far away from each other as possible. But then as you add a little bit of salt, you can actually screen that repulsive interaction and the equilibrium phase becomes FCC. Uh, and then you can also um, change the interaction by adding some surfactant uh, and this will make the interaction completely positive or attractive. Uh, and then at very high volume fraction you obtain this glassy phase here. So I made several different colloidal glasses with different kinds of additives and you can see that the results are quite interesting. So here when the um, system, the interaction is repulsive when I fit the average Fourier coefficients from my glass, I get a large proportion of BCC and FCC clusters contributing. When I screen the interaction uh, by adding some salt, then I get more FCC clusters and a small amount of BCC and icosahedral clusters. And then when I make the interaction attractive by using a surfactant, the only measurable signal I get uh, is from icosahedral clusters. Now, you might be wondering, what is this large gray component here, which I've labeled RAN? <laughs> well, that is because unfortunately for this proof of concept experiment, the aperture I used was 15 times the size of a polyhedron. And so um, this large RAN component is from clusters that are far, too far away from each other in the aperture. Um, giving rise to uncorrelated uh, diffraction. But nevertheless, um, we've identified a new kind of capability, which is uh, quantifying local order in glasses from diffraction alone. Um, so you can think of that as being populating this area here of the phase diagram, where people just said, that's a glass, that's a glass, that's a glass. Now we can say, this is a glass that has FCC dominant order. This is a glass that has BCC dominant order. Uh, and then we've also made a new observation, which is that um, somehow the local order in glasses reflects the stable local order in this underlying phase diagram. So at the moment, I'm on the way to demonstrating the usefulness of this approach for atomic glasses and uh, Hoi and Pham is really helping out um, with her hard work. So you can see that this is, is promising in the sense that um, our uh, average Fourier coefficients seem to be fitted quite nicely uh, considering the angular symmetries that you expect uh, from um, the uh, polyhedra from the um, crystalline phases in the phase diagram. Uh, but we still have uh, a little bit of work to do there. So I would actually really like to spend a lot of time rhapsodizing about the properties of metallic glasses, um, but I, I don't think that this is quite the forum. Uh, however, I will just say that um, metallic glasses, uh, you, you can think about them as being as strong as a metal alloy, and yet somehow having the elasticity uh, of a polymer, more of a polymer phase. And they're such, you know, amazing materials. Um, they're very smooth. The so surface is very smooth like a normal glass. They're formable in some senses. You can blow them like a normal glass. Uh, they're very strong, as I said, and elastic. 
Uh, and also sometimes they can have a limited amount of ductility. So the Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA actually think that these are such great materials, they have an active program in developing them for their different applications. So here are a couple of applications that I thought would appeal to people in the School of Physics. Uh, so you can see here one of the suggested materials um, to uh, make the edge of this starshade interferometer to find exoplanets is actually a metallic glass because it's so smooth and it doesn't have facets due to crystal grains. Uh, also, metallic glasses have been suggested um, uh, for low temperature rovers because the surface is so smooth, you don't need to use grease. And I mean, these are materials that really don't want to be a glass. So, you know, uh, metals um, form close packed crystal structures. They really don't want to be a glass. And so when you form them, you have to form them quite violently. So by quenching them quickly. And usually this involves um, injecting a melt onto a cooled spinning copper wheel, which is going at about 1000 RPM. Uh, and if you do this, um, as my collaborator at CSIRO does, then you obtain little ribbons like this. Okay, but in the previous slide, I was hinting that there are yet more problems with glasses. Uh, and that is that um, we don't really understand how they deform and they also suffer from this uh, brittle mechanical failure. So this is a familiar picture of how um, crystals deform um, by the creation and propagation of dislocations. Uh, in contrast for glasses, we actually have very little insight into what the structures are that are mediating the deformation. So here are two ideas that have been suggested in the past. Um, this is the uh, creation and diffusion of free volume uh, and also the um, transformation of these um, zones, these zones that are somehow sort of structurally soft. Um, however, the size of these zones and the nature of these zones um, is still uh, quite unknown. Uh, and here I'm just showing, um, citing an, an early investigation I did with David Paganin, where we actually looked for pockets of free volume that had condensed into nano-sized voids. And um, we, we found none. <laughs> and so we reported a, a null result. And I just wanted to um, highlight this uh, because sometimes null results actually put you on a, a better research path. But as I said, um, glasses often suffer from catastrophic brittle failure. Uh, and this is where you have some kind of structural transformation in a coordinated fashion in a single plane. And so over here you can see um, this is what's happened to this metallic glass here. Uh, it's been pulled apart and it's failed in a single plane. And this is actually quite related to the kinds of avalanches that you get in granular materials. Uh, so if, for example, you compare this scar in a sand dune to the fracture surface of this metallic glass, uh, then you can actually see similar patterns. So you can see small events and large events, and actually the size of the events follows um, a nice scaling relationship. So this is the stress strain curve from an experiment like this, where you can see that after the glass has reached its elastic limit, you have all of these different sized plastic events, um, and they're all of these smaller and larger avalanches in the material. Now, people have done a lot of experiments on glasses to try to understand the structure of these um, deforming zones. So I'll just highlight some of the work that's been done here. Uh, but I will note that these, all of these experiments and simulations rely on the fact that you have the particle positions uh, in three dimensions, which is a bit of a restriction. So here you can see when you've done uh, confocal optical microscopy of microspheres, uh, people have detected this quadrupolar strain signature from the transformation of an Eschelby inclusion. 
which is quite nice. Uh, here in these simulations, people have looked at the local deviation from a fine strain and uh, reported that this is actually quite a good signifier of a transformation, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of a transformation which is irreversible. And by a fine strain, I mean strain, so the movement of particles in the same magnitude and direction as the applied strain. Uh, here also people have used machine learning and a set of 170 local structural parameters to identify uh, a kind of softness parameter. But potentially there, there are simpler approaches. So here I'm just going to dive a little bit into the elasticity theory of glasses to justify another approach that I've had with some collaborators. So this approach depends on this chi i here, which is a vector parameter that encapsulates the degree of centrosymmetry of neighboring particles around a central particle. And this chi i, it's essentially the weighted sum of the unit vectors from the central particle to all the neighboring particles surrounding it. So when we strain uh, an amorphous specimen, the force imbalance on any given particle is actually equal to this vector parameter here, the degree of centrosymmetry, multiplied by the applied strain. And the reason why this is a very interesting idea is because it takes this really local information here and strongly links it to the larger scale cooperative motion that you see when you strain the material. So for example, if you plot out this degree of centrosymmetry, and here I've taken these plots from this publication here, if you plot out this degree of centrosymmetry, you can see it's random, it's very short range, and it fluctuates. But then if you plot out the displacement field after strain, so the displacement uh, direction and magnitude of individual particles from their initial configuration to their final configuration, you can see these large swirling cooperative and large scale motions. And somehow these motions are linked to the local centrosymmetry uh, and also the propensity for the non-affine displacements. So here you can see again if we have a structure which is centrosymmetric and we strain it, then after the strain the structure is still centrosymmetric and the force imbalance is zero. So it will just transform um, in the same, uh, with the same magnitude and direction as the applied strain. Uh, if, however, we have a non-centrosymmetric um, local arrangement, then after the strain has been applied, the force imbalance will mean that um, the net force is uh, not zero and we will have some non-affine displacements uh, after the strain. Now, Previously, when I introduced um, the angular symmetry parameters that I measured from my nano diffraction patterns, uh, there's something that I obscured, which I, I will now um, bring to light. So each of the nano diffraction patterns that I measured had like non prominent non-zero odd angular symmetries. So what this means is that the Friedel symmetry was absent. So the intensity at Q in general didn't equal the intensity at minus Q. Now, we know from scattering theory that if you have um, kinematical scattering or single scattering, then your far field diffraction pattern is simply the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform of your projected object. And the projected object is in general real, and so that means that under kinematical scattering conditions, um, you will automatically have inversion or Friedel symmetry. It doesn't really matter what your object is. However, um, Friedel symmetry is broken if you have dynamical diffraction from an object that lacks centrosymmetry. 
So here you can see um, an example uh, using electron nano diffraction, where um, if I make my output my um, uh, uh, output my wave uh, from my focused probe here, then we have a high degree of centrosymmetry or Friedel symmetry in the diffraction pattern as the wave propagates through the material and undergoes like dynamical diffraction from interacting um, with the material at different depths, then you can see that the diffraction pattern actually breaks inversion symmetry. And so these observations led me to propose that I could measure an interesting parameter related to the local centrosymmetry in a glass just by mapping out the breakdown of the Friedel symmetry in my diffraction patterns. So the ratio of the even Fourier coefficients to the odd Fourier coefficients. And so I tested this idea out by using simulations. So here you can see for um, symmetric uh, polyhedra, the diffraction pattern uh, retains Friedel symmetry. So here I'm plotting uh, the log of the intensity uh, um, as a function of Q versus the intensi intensity uh, as a function of minus Q. But if I introduce some random displacements so that the centrosymmetry of the polyhedra are disrupted, then you can see that the pattern breaks Friedel symmetry. And then if I do this, you know, averaging over many different configurations, you can see that my centrosymmetry parameter here actually um, decreases smoothly as the symmetry of the configurations is reduced. So again, I looked for um, an experiment that would showcase the usefulness of this parameter to the greatest degree. Uh, so what I did was I um, looked at colloidal glasses at the synchrotron and I uh, did some in situ deformation uh, to see what would happen to local structures when I deformed them. And I calculated this centrosymmetry parameter as I discussed on the previous slide. But I also wanted to look and see, you know, if centrosymmetry really did correlate to local stability as predicted by the elasticity theory of glasses. Uh, and so I devised a method to look at the local stability uh, of polyhedra as well. Uh, and then because it's a very interesting engineering parameter, uh, I also devised a way to get an estimation of the local structural anisotropy or strain. Uh, and you can see that this kind of experiment where I'm scanning my beam over a specimen and looking at local structural order, local structural stability, uh, really has the capability of mapping between the local and the global. So here's how I looked at the local stability. Uh, I did a, a spatio-temporal scanning strategy where I scanned an area and then went back to the beginning. And so I obtained a diffraction pattern from the same area uh, at different points in time. And I calculated this local time correlation coefficient. And to calculate the local anisotropy or strain, I looked at the position of this first main diffracted peak and I fitted that position with a strain function, which is given here. And so here are some examples of, of data that I fitted. Uh, and this gives you the in-plane components of the strain tensor. Uh, and from these, I extracted other parameters. So this is the normal strain. So it's the degree of local compaction or dilation. Uh, and this is the uh, shear strain here, which is the degree of local shearing. So these are the results of my in situ deformation experiment. And I apologize um, for the busyness of this slide. Uh, I will just sort of break it down into parts for you and then I'll, I'll pull out uh, the main conclusions. So in this column here, I'm mapping the local stability of my glass. 
In this column is the local centrosymmetry. Here is the normal strain and here is the shear strain. This is the glass before deformation and this is the glass after I've compressed it. Under each map is the radially averaged autocorrelation function that shows you the extent of any correlations in the map. Uh, and then down the bottom here are histograms that show you the distribution of values from each one of these maps. So I'll just um, set a scale for you here. The uh, diameter of each um, coordination polyhedron is actually one micron. And so you can see immediately that all of these mapped parameters actually fluctuate at the length scale of a single polyhedron. However, when we've, uh, sh and this is reflected in these uh, autocorrelation functions, but when we um, compress the glass, so induce deformations within it, you can see that um, these correlation lengths are actually uh, increased. And that's because we have these appearance here of these shear bands. Uh, and the, the easiest way to tell where they are is to actually have a look at the local stability where you can see that in these areas, the local stability has greatly decreased. Now, in a way, perhaps, you can think of this as being like a local transformation back to a phase which is more like the liquid. Now, comparing the correlations between the different maps, you can see that the areas where the stability has gone down also correspond to areas where this local centrosymmetry has been decreased uh, and also the normal strain has increased enormously. And these trends are also evident from these uh, histograms down here. But I think what I find surprising and what I found surprising when I first unpacked this data set is that actually like the change in the, the local centrosymmetry before and after compression, like the decrease, is incredibly small, given that in the shear bands we have this enormous increase in the normal strain. And I think the only way you can you know, uh, understand that is by noting that really we're having very coordinated local transformations to lower symmetry structures uh, inside the shear band areas. Uh, so you can also mine these maps a little bit more uh, to try to understand these uh, different correlations between the parameters. Uh, so here I've plotted out um, the mean and standard error of the structural parameters, so the centrosymmetry, normal and shear strain, uh, as a function of the quartile in the um, local stability. Uh, so from these plots, you can see that high stability, so the fourth quartile in um, stability, really does strongly correlate to high centrosymmetry, uh, low normal strain and high shear strain, uh, and that these trends are actually very much exaggerated uh, once you've deformed the material. Um, so what this suggests is that Inside our shear bands, we have these areas of high symmetry, these high symmetry polyhedra that were actually quenched in from the liquid, uh, but then transform in a coordinated way to these lower symmetry structures, uh, increasing the, the normal strain. And so again, I have to thank uh, Ho Yen uh, for all of her hard work uh, towards this project. Uh, so we're actually trying to look at similar structures in a shear band in a metallic glass uh, and we're using Monash's um, new uh, FibSem to do it. So here you can see the surface of a metallic glass where we get a little bit of contrast from the shear step marking out a shear band in the glass. Uh, we've prepared these areas um, to lift out in the cross-sectional configuration. So we have these two fiducial markers here. Uh, and here is this particular area lifted out here where you can see the fiducial markers and you can just make out the tiny, tiny 
shear step in the surface um, that marks out the shear band. Um, so Tim and I are um, still puzzling over the meaning of all of the features in these maps. And I think you'll agree that it's a particularly rich data set. Uh, and to do that, uh, I've been looking at some of the recent publications in the literature, uh, and in particular this one um, by uh, this Italian, uh, well, largely Italian group. And so here I'm showing uh, a model glass which has been strained. Uh, and this is the interpolated uh, displacement field in that glass. So here you can see the color scale that shows the magnitude uh, of the um, uh, displacements. And so based upon like, this model and also from staring at the maps that I've produced in my measurements, uh, I, I'm suggesting this model uh, of a glass, which consists of three interpenetrating networks. So you have this backbone here of high centrosymmetry and high rigidity polyhedra, as you can see from these points here. And then you also have some structurally soft regions that are unstable, and they actually undergo very coordinated displacements. Okay, so the magnitude and the direction of these displacements is all the same. And then in between, you have the area where the strain actually concentrates. So for example, here um, where you have your net flow of uh, particles away, but this area is still, you have local dilation. And here you have some local contraction. And so um, this model actually explains the correlations and anti-correlations that I see uh, in my measured maps. Now, looking at these um, interpolated displacement fields, you can see that there's actually something curious about these points um, of, of low displacement. Um, and often, if you look at the displacement field around them, you can detect some kind of net circulation. Uh, and indeed, this group have suggested that these points are actually some kind of topological defect. So here they've defined um, a sort of Burgers vector, uh, which you can uh, calculate if you um, do a closed uh, contour around different regions of your displacement field. And you can see that this Burgers vector here will only be non-zero if you have significant non-affine displacements. Uh, and they've gone ahead and they've had a look at these different features in the stress-strain curve um, and the magnitude of the Burgers vector they measure. Uh, and they can see that these large scale features here actually correspond to um, areas in the uh, strain where you have a large number of these defects popping up. Now, these are not defects that you can see in the static field, like crystals. So here you can measure a non-zero Burgers vector in the static structure of a crystal because the um, order parameter is very obvious. These are actually defects which you can only see in the displacement field or the dynamical field. And so what this suggests is that actually we perhaps should be really looking for an order parameter in the dynamical field for glasses rather than in the static field. Uh, and this, if this is something that interests you, I suggest you uh, have a look at these um, uh, papers that have been written on the subject here. Okay, so to conclude, um, potentially small beam diffraction and looking for changes in speckle may have all the ingredients required for a generalized crystallography. For glasses in particular, it seems that local centrosymmetry might be the key to understanding their rigidity and deformation. Uh, and then fairly soon, perhaps, um, dynamical defects and their logical extension of dynamical order 
could change our understanding of what is a solid and what is a liquid. So thank you for listening. I must admit I don't feel entirely qualified to comment on that. Um, like I do think that um, the dynamical defects are intriguing. I think they could make a lot of the issues around understanding glasses much more tractable because if we can measure and find these dynamical defects, it's a countable number of objects. Um, in terms of uh, whether there is a more subtle kind of symmetry breaking in the structural realm. I mean, I, I don't know, perhaps you're familiar with the work of um, Nelson, where he has uh, suggested that, um, so potentially glasses have broken symmetry in a curved space rather than in, you know, sort of a three-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, like, potentially that's the case. Uh, but yeah, as I said before, I don't feel particularly qu qualified to comment on that. I don't know if Tim has any. Yeah, I'm going to be more direct. Um, I think you're talking about an order parameter manifold, which should be wrapped in each of a number of times for there to be a topology that you can write down as an index. But I think your question is about whether there are other features on the manifold, like any to one mappings, such as catastrophe. Yes. Which can occur before there's any uh, integer wrapping or integer circulation. And we haven't actually looked. <laughs> uh, I, I suspect they're there and they might be precursors to these uh, Burgers vector singularities. And it's an interesting question because they might be there in the static data. It's very hard to measure the dynamic displacement field. So we'll, we'll look at that. <laughs> Okay. At some point. To the, to the um, lengths between dynamical defects tell you, and is there some characteristic length to the distances between these dynamical defects that's informative? Uh, so that's actually, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, the paper on dynamical defects is actually quite recent um, and the work that started on that is relatively recent. Uh, so yeah, I think that yeah, they could interact, the characteristic distance between them, whether they have a topological charge or plus or minus one, all of these things could be fascinating. And I mean, my particular challenge will be, can I find concrete evidence of them <laughs> in my measured maps from small beam diffraction. Um, yeah. mm. ah, Elliot. So I think I have a question about your, um, your your theory of the structure of glass as the interplay between the, these different networks. Um, so as an explanation, it seems to uh, fit all, all of the observed data. I guess my question is, um, it seems so far like a very qualitative model. Is there some way that you can uh, quantify it and turn it from something that you um, look at a pack, look at, look at a, pack, a pattern and pull out the parameters versus being like predictive, if, if that makes any sense? Yes, yes. I mean, that's a great observation. I quantitative is what we're working towards. But I will say that it's like, that's the first time maps like that have actually been presented like and compared. It's the first time local stability has been linked to, to local structure in a glass. And um, so, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I spend quite a lot of time thinking, um, 
How can we make this more quantitative? Can we sort of put some kind of threshold on the, the local centrosymmetry and say, this configuration will move, this configuration won't? Um, this would be very powerful, like, you know, scientifically, but also from an engineering perspective. So what has been the limitation that is only being done now? Is it uh, observational um, or um, modeling? You mean experimentally or? Well, I mean, you said that it's just been done now in the last I don't know, couple of years. What, how come this wasn't done, say, 40 years ago? Uh, well, is it the experimental methods are more sophisticated or? Certainly, I think, um, experimental methods have really advanced. So like in the world of the uh, scanning transmission electron microscope, we now have um, really fast detectors where we can get you know, the full diffraction pattern at every point uh, and scan the beam very quickly. Um, say similar advances have occurred um, in synchrotrons. Uh, but I think the, um, the example of glasses is actually really fascinating <laughs> because uh, with modeling and simulation, people have actually had access to all of the atomic or particle positions in three dimensions, like through an apparent, you know, arrest or glass transition. And yet, you know, we still haven't solved <laughs> the glass transition problem. So I think that there's like a, um, a conceptual, a, a conceptual link that still hasn't been made. Um, I think Sometimes, you know, experiment can articulate a question more eloquently than, than models. So, for example, for my last experiment, I really set out to see what is the relationship between local structure and stability. Um, yeah. Yep. Perhaps another question, uh, sort of building off uh, Kavant's one. From, from what I understand, you're saying that there not only was it a sort of a bit of a development of experimental methods, but also there was a conceptual uh, development, there was a conceptual change that needed to happen um, mm -hmm. related to what you were saying at the start with, has it been too successful? Um, where do you see, this is a very speculative question, where do you see that conceptual, uh, do you see that conceptual change occurring? Do you see it, uh, you know, building into a broader field? Where is it going? So, yeah, I mean, I think, um, as I yeah, indicated at various points in my talk, actually looking for an order parameter in the structural realm has been redundant, <laughs> by and large redundant. Uh, and so now there is the suggestion that uh, it might be more appropriate to seek it in sort of dynamical spheres, looking at the dynamics of the structure. Um, I think this is very promising. Like, it, it feels like a very promising direction to me. But because, you know, uh, I, I do structural measurements, I always think that somehow everything is related to structure. So, so 